finishing our little aspect of looking at man. Do you believe that you were created to worship? Do you believe that you were created to worship? I certainly believe God created us that way. And we will either worship the one true God, or, as the case often is throughout the world, man and woman end up worshipping something else. Often, we end up worshipping ourselves. Man likes to receive worship. Man likes to create all kinds of religion to worship. But it is a natural part of who we are as human beings created in the likeness and the image of God that we do, and do, we do indeed worship. So it's wonderful to be able to come together like this as the body of Christ and to be able to do exactly that, to be able to worship. Because when we do, we are exercising an important part of what we are as beings made of God to do exactly that, to worship. Let's pick it up quickly. Second, yep, go back to back one. Let's pick it up again in second chapter of Genesis. And let's listen to these words once again. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up. So very, very early days. For the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land. Now we're talking a bit more about the environment. Very green. From the land and was watering the whole, the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man. Notice, God set up everything first before he put man and woman into the environment. God had a very set process, not random acts or we'll try this and we'll try that. No, everything was in order. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. Amen to that. We're not dead. <laughs> We're not dead creatures, people. We are supposed to be living. Get the life, you know, that the life breathed into us from God. And man became, he became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden, in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. All right, let's just pray for a moment. Let's allow these words to sink and to our hearts, and let's meditate on some things a bit more deeply. Father God, Lord, as we open up your word again, we thank you. You've given us an open door. In fact, Jesus Christ said, I am the door. And Lord, we go and we enter through him into a beautiful relationship that we experience now with you, almighty God. We thank you that that door has been opened and we thank you, you have invited us in through the invitation of the gospel. Father, we are so blessed, we are so privileged. Help us to recollect all that we have in Christ this morning and all that we are as new creatures in him. The old, old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. We thank you how wonderfully and beautifully we have been recreated in the image of the one who formed us, even the image of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that we are to be Christ-like him. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you we can worship you in spirit and in truth. And Lord, we pray, Lord, that this message would uh, remind us, refresh us, even recreate in us, if need be, more and more, of the likeness of Christ as we look at the condition of man from his creation to where we are now, to where we will find man, perhaps even in the future sense. So Lord, in all these things, help us to grasp it and to understand that we can't do these things without you. 
They must be spiritually discerned. So we look to the ministry and the power of the Holy Spirit now to illuminate our eyes and our understanding on these words to enable them to be put into our hearts and our minds so we can understand more fully what you have told us in revelation of truth. I ask and pray now for your ministry at work through your word that we worship you more. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, you, you can reflect a little bit last time, last week, last week, boy, has a week gone fast or what? But I touched on two key points. It was about the image that we had been created into. God made us in created man in the image of himself and in his likeness. And we contemplated and thought about what image are we trying to portray? The image of God or the image of something else. It's very, very important. And I also touched on the fact about social movements. Do you recall that? And that was just to put to you just how and what man is capable of doing in trying to organize himself into a particular kind of movement. To borrow the words that Arnold often uses, there's nothing new under the sun. Just think for a moment, about halfway through Genesis, or no, before halfway, what was perhaps we could consider the first social movement? Think about that for a moment. The first social movement, that we could term it that way, that took place in Genesis. What do you think? Revolved or uh, involved a, a tower? All right, now you got it. Yeah, the Tower of Babel. Perhaps the first major social movement where man got himself organized together for a particular political purpose, when it's uh, talking about the authority and the, uh, the godship of, of the one true God in heaven and what man was determined to do against God. Was God happy about it? Absolutely not. But we're talking about people, men like Nimrod, Tower of Babel, the effects of it are still very fresh in our society today. It takes a little bit of looking sometimes, but nevertheless, it is there. Social movements, societies, man. That's what's happening, and even today. And we talk about image. And when we talk about image, we could also easily branch off from image and start talking about identity. From our image, we get identity. What is our identity as Christians? Who do we identify with? We identify with the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ, amen? But there is an identity when we're talking about man, we're looking at, in the past, if we're looking back to Genesis, thinking about examples of what man is capable of doing when we look at social movements, but what about where man's going in the future? Think about this for a moment, and this is how all key doctrines rattle together. They are interrelated. They intersect at different points, which I mentioned last week. This doctrine of understanding man is very, very important. It might not be sexy or sensual or anything like that, but once you get a grasp of it and you understand of where we are today, where we have come from, what God has revealed, and what things are going to look like not too long from now, I think so, looking at what's going on around us in the world, there is a man coming. He has been prophesied and spoken of from the Old Testament, the New Testament, the writings of Apostle Paul, even into what John's given us in Revelation. From very ancient old days, even to what has yet to come. A man is coming. He is called the son of perdition. Hence, we know he's a male because it's called the son. The son of perdition. 
and thinking about social movements today. In your own time, look carefully at, say, for example, the 11th chapter of Daniel, where there is even just a little inkling of indication that this man who is going to come on the scene at some point soon, he possibly, and I hate the word possibly, it looks like he is not interested in the affection of women. Think about social movements today. Think about even perhaps what the Apostle Paul has written in Romans about the deprivation of humanity, that man is, is having uh, has lost his natural affection for, for women. Man with man and woman with woman. The natural affections of how God created. Put it to you like this. In the beginning, God created Adam and Eve. He didn't create Adam and Steve. There's a man coming. And it looks like he too could quite possibly be not interested in the natural affection of woman. If he's in that kind of condition, think about what's happening in our cultures today regarding gender and things like that. It starts to get pretty interesting. All right? But this is where I say, if you look at particular studies of man, what God has told us what's happened in the past, what we see what's going on around us today, and even what's possibly looking like on the horizon. All these things are interrelated and they, they work together. They begin to make some sense. These are not random acts of take a little bit here and take a little bit there, but when you put the pieces together, it becomes very... So, if we understand and we look at what's going on around us and we think about what's possibly coming, what it's going to look like in time to come, how do we get there? We need to understand where we came from, where it all came from in the first place. And that's why I stress to you, as a, as a contemporary evangelical church, and we are late in time, we are, it is a late hour in which we are here today, in time, in terms of history, where we've come from, and where thing, what things are happening today, where things are, 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 are being foretold of what things are going to look like in the future, it's a very good idea to be able to understand this particular doctrine of man. Bring up there, you're already there, but the creation, his fall. I've got to try and move a little bit more quickly now. But I just put those things to you, at least to try and whet your appetite. Although we are looking at things in the past, they are related to things that have been prophesied in the future. Really, really important stuff. We don't know these things. It's easy just to go along and be entertained by Hollywood and just not be aware of what's going on around us. And we just, we'll just be, we'll be like that, that frog that, that, that gets boiled uh, alive because it's comfortable as an environment and nice cool, cool water, but... When the, when the kettle or the fire puts under it, it slowly begins to warm up the water. The, the frog just adjust, adjusts his metabolism until eventually the water is boiling and he, he, he's cooked alive in a sense. We are very, very vulnerable people, folks. Very, very vulnerable to spiritual things that's going on. And we might really want to push ourselves to, to really pay attention to what God has said to what's going on around us so that we are not taken by surprise. That would be a, a, it's a key strategy of, of Satan himself to, to catch people unawares and, and to surprise with an ambush. And before you know it, you know, he's, he's done his damage and, and it's too, too late. Bring up the slide four there. In fact, we've already looked at this. So go to the, yep. Let's look at that one there. 
This is the book of the generations of Adam. Genesis chapter 5. The first main verses that we looked at in Genesis chapter 2 talk about the generations of the heavens and earth. And now Genesis brings in another generation. The generation of Adam. The generations and, and that man would flow from him. When God created man, he made him in the likeness of God, male and female, he created them. No confusion there. And he blessed them. Who likes to be blessed? Put your hand up this morning. Blessed. He blessed them and named them man. That's what the name Adam means. It means man. Uh, when they were created. Now, it's interesting the way in which blessed is used predominantly in the early parts of Genesis. By blessing, it meant that they were able to multiply. God blessed them and he told them, go and, and multiply. He even blessed other creatures as well so that they could multiply. So the way in which the word blessed is being used early on in the Bible is in the sense for the purposes of increase of, within themselves. When Adam uh, had lived 130 years, he's still a young fella, he fathered a son in his own, now this is a key word, a key phrase, in his own likeness. Was Adam in sin or still innocent at this point? Had he fallen into sin by this point in chapter 5? Yes, he had. He had fallen into sin, both he and his wife Eve. Now it's important now that we understand that the generations being produced by Adam are now in the likeness of Adam, a fallen Adam. Hence, the condition of Adam's fallenness, sinfulness, is now being passed on through the generations that he and his wife are creating and making. So, in the son after his own likeness, after his image, and named him Seth. So, God made man to be in the likeness of his image originally, Likeness, we have a con nice condensed word, mean godliness, godlikeness. And this is man, this was man's nature to be. The Genesis account, the beginnings, uh, the origins, hence the word Genesis. But this could all be just a nice mythical fairy tale, and we don't have to take this too seriously, right? Well, Jesus Christ takes it literally and seriously. Matthew chapter 19, verse 4. Jesus speaking, And he answered and said unto them, Have you not read hmm, that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? There was a particular time when there was a beginning. And at that time, at that specific time, God made them. It doesn't say he developed them over a long period of time. There was a particular point of the beginning where God made male and female. And that was it. It was done. That's what Jesus taught. That's what Jesus believed. Jesus believed that there was male and female created at a point in the beginning, and God did it. Notice Jesus didn't believe in evolution. Can't blame him. The evolution probably wasn't around then, but nevertheless, the point is, Jesus affirmed what Genesis said. That's what Jesus taught. That's what Jesus believed. Let's go to the next slide. Affirming our faith with truth. The truth is that man has fallen. A lot of people can't accept that. What are you saying? I'm, I'm a good person. I'm, I do this, I go this, I, I give to charities. That's not what God is telling us. God is specifically telling us that we are fallen. In time past, relate to what's happening around us and think about how this relates to time prophesied, events prophesied in the future. They are all interrelated. Now the serpent was more crafty 
than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God uh, actually say? Did God actually say? You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? What's the first thing that, that the, the serpent is trying to do here? He's trying to cast doubt upon God's word. If he can just get Eve and then Adam, if he can just get them to doubt God's command, then he can put in his own instructions. Eve, why don't you just, you know, you don't, why don't you just make up your own mind? Why are you allowing people to tell, why do you think that God's telling you what to do? Why don't you just do it yourself? You're, you're capable enough. You're intelligent enough. You don't have to listen. To, and we, you know, God's word, what, what he said is, is quite debatable. He wasn't really clear. Why don't you just take it upon yourself? Be a little bit independent. Do your own thing. It's a great deception going on here, isn't there? The fall was the result of accepting a temptation to act contrary to God's command. Satan puts doubt into the eve of, uh, into the sorry, into the mind of Eve. The word was authoritative, the word of God, the command of God. Satan sought to establish his own authority by bringing doubt into the mind of Eve. And we have been naturally disliking authority ever since. Think about that. Ever since then, we've had a dislike, a natural dislike. Don't you tell me what to do. I'll go behind mum and dad's back. They won't know. They said to do this, but, you know, who's going to find out? I know more than my teacher. Hey, I'm not going to do my homework. And as for my boss, well, it's about time he gave me a pay rise, you know. And by the way, I want six weeks holiday. And I want a month sick leave. Boss not going to tell me what he doesn't know. You know what I'm saying? This is a natural part within the, the likeness of Adam. The way in which people were formed in his likeness. And this is what Satan brought in here. It's not a joke. It's, not, it's so serious. And no wonder gender has been so confused in our day and age because everything else has been distorted, beginning with God's word, and it just flows naturally into all aspects of his creation, what man is up to, what he and she have been doing. We've got to think in a different way. We've got to think in with the mind of Christ that's been given to us. Things are a long, long way away from what God had originated. We have fallen a long way from God's original commands. Quickly bring up the next point there. The consequences of disobeying God are presented as being painless. You don't need Panadol. You don't need morphine for this. In fact, sin is quite a lot of fun. It's pleasurable and enjoy yourself, you know, hit the town, have a good time with the bros and, you know, it's painless, it's not going to hurt you, nothing's going to come back and bite you, eh, wrong, <laughs> the consequences are far, far reaching, and what's happening today, what I've said numerous times now, where things are heading prophesied in time to come, boy, is the consequences they are going to be painful. Unrighteous incentives are given to disobey God in this portion. Eve now has believed a distorted view of the truth and justifies her action of her sin. What does it read there? But the serpent. Up to this point, we've been reading, and God said, let there be light. God said, let us make man in our image. God said, it is not good for man to be alone. Hence, we'll make a help meet suitable for him. God has been the one who's been given, given the instructions. But now, it's the serpent's turn. 
What's the serpent got to say about the situation? And by the way, it's only a serpent. Why be afraid if it was a scary dragon monster? Sure, we might be a little bit, Eve would be on, on, on doing, a, doing a quick runaway. But, you know, it's, it's only a little serpent. I got, I got this under control, guys. Yeah, yeah, whatever. whatever. Easy, easy stuff. Not at all. This is how crafty he is. The serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, she begins to justify it now. Justifying disobedience. And that's what disobedience is all about. It's all about justification for something else, to do something else. It was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. How many times does the word of God say, having made themselves wise, they became fools? This is the temptation. She took of its fruit and ate, and she also gave... Eve's very generous. <laughs> She's a sharing kind of creature. She doesn't take it all for herself. Nobody can accuse her of being greedy. She's going to share. And this is what sin does. It's always about finding somebody else to get involved in the crime. So I'm not going to be the only guilty one. I like to share the guilt around. And we'll share the spoils or whatever. It's always good to get somebody else involved. She took of it, gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. This is the first instance of self-determination on earth. The creation of God became self-determining. I will do it my way. So the famous song of Frank Sinatra sings, I did it my way. And the middle letter of sin is what? It's all about I. I, 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 self-determination. Don't tell me what to do. I will determine what's going to be going on around here. Thank you very much. I've got it all worked out. I've got my own plans. No, nope. I don't need God. I don't need you. I've got I. It's all about me, myself, and I. Another trinity. Self-determination seen as a great opportunity. Go and get out there. It's your opportunity. Take it. It's there. It's yours. It's all yours for the taking. No wonder Eve's eyes lit up. Whoa, this is going to be something. Be careful about what opportunities are presented. Think about the consequences before trying to take on a certain opportunity that gets presented. Don't be too fast in accepting it. Think a little bit ahead. What will be the consequence of this? Maybe it might be even wise to go away and pray about it first. Get God involved. Get the I out of the equation and get the J for Jesus into it. But it only led to a condition of being lost. Lost without the means of self-recovery. The temptation and the delight and the desire was about self-determination. But nobody gave Eve the instruction manual where at the bottom of the fine print it said, you won't be able to recover yourself if you go down this path. That's the worst part of being lost is that we can't recover ourselves. We don't have the means and the resources to do it ourselves. Satan doesn't tell humanity that. The leaders of the social movements of today don't tell anybody that. They don't talk about the ramifications or the consequences of who's, what's the outcome going to be. There will be no ability for self-recovery. Hence, we need another man. His name is Jesus. And him, and only him, has the power to rescue what's going on here. 
Only he has the power to rescue you. You can have all your self-determination this morning, but you cannot have self-recovery. It doesn't work that way. Quickly look at the next part. The consequences for man. To the woman. To the woman, he said, God said, I will surely multiply your pain in childbearing. Remember, Satan was trying to make it as painless as possible. Just take it. It's going to be good for you. God actually tells the truth. No, it's not going to be painless. These are the consequences to begin with. I will multiply your pain in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire will be to your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife. See, Adam had stopped listening to the voice of God. And has eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed now is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. There's nothing attractive. There's nothing ever attractive of what evil and darkness can offer you. It looks attractive. It looks like a quick fix here and now. It looks like a shortcut, quick road access to something higher and greater. But there is nothing, absolutely nothing good about wickedness and darkness and sin. Nothing good whatsoever. The only way as Christians, not the only way, but an important way, by means by which we overcome sin in our own lives, is by learning to not have an appetite for it. That's what the serpent appealed to Eve. It was her appetite. The fruit was looking good. Boy, does it look tasty and juicy. And man, are you going to be something else after you've taken it? That was her appetite. And it's the same for Adam as well. What's our appetites like? Do we have an appetite for a particular kind of sin? Probably we do. Let's be honest. We probably do. Identify what your appetite is. Be honest and confess it before God. This is an important means by winning the victory over sin is by having a change of appetite. An appetite that changes from all the lusciousness of what sin looks like and may taste like to an appetite of righteousness. And that's going to come about by being staying close to the Lord. It's being close to his word. And it's about in encouraging and each other, being close in our fellowship as well. Appetites have to change. If the appetite for sin doesn't change, the pain will continue. The consequences may get more dire. The end results aren't going to be a light at the end of the tunnel. It's not going to be a good outcome got to make that really clear you've got to accept that from me you know it within your own self by your own experience the pain that sin causes when we touch it when we get a little bit too even too close to it it only takes a little bit of getting close to the fire to feel the heat and to smell the smoke we don't have to put our hand into the fire to know it's going to burn and it's going to hurt Take it on board. Quickly now, we're nearly finished. What else was the consequence? He, God, drove out the man. Actually, not in a car, we didn't go driving here, but the sense of pushed him out and there was no coming back in that way. And at the east of the garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword and that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. What had Adam and Eve eaten from? The tree of the knowledge 
of good and evil. Now, in that fallen condition, what would happen if they ate from the tree of life, which needs to be guarded now? If Adam and Eve would eat from the tree of life, they would be in that fallen condition forever. That's why this tree has to be guarded. The tree of life. To live like that forever and ever, without any possible change. That would be an absolute, absolute disaster. Aren't you glad that God's got angels that obey him, that protected Adam and Eve from getting even further and deeper into hot water? Thankfully, they didn't eat from the tree of life. Now we have another life giver that we are told to taste and see that the Lord is good. We feed from the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our beautiful tree of life. So, last and least, not least at all. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. We can see from the Genesis record, if we can understand what was told from uh, to us from the beginning, we get an understanding of why things are the way they are today in our societies. And we can make sense of the man of perdition that is going to come. When is he going to come? When is he going to come? When the conditions are just right. When all the society, the nations of the world, when they are in such a condition that they are going to be ready to receive him. Part and parcel of all these social movements are heading in a particular direction. They're not happening by random chance and for nothing uh, important than what may come in the future. No, they are all part of the conditioning agents to get society into a particular condition, ready with open arms to receive a particular man. Hey, the world will say, I can identify with that. Yeah, I don't want to worship. He, he looks like God to me. The world is going to love this man like something else. Read it. You've got to look at it yourself, but I'm just bringing these things to your attention, where man is going, what he's going to be like, the very pinnacle of the man Satan himself, just as Jesus was the pinnacle man of God, as God. So likewise, the antithesis, the Antichrist, will also be in the likeness of the devil himself in the flesh. But look at it more deeply yourself because of the condition that came about by such action sin is about self-interest self-satisfaction self-determination but there is a seed of hope up there on the screen a seed was also planted in genesis not in the garden this time but in the seed of a promise a covenant I will put enmity between you and the woman. He's talking to the serpent. And between your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head. Now, here's the hope of someone who's going to take care of this serpent, who elsewhere we find out is Satan himself. One who will defeat the serpent, the promise of a gospel of good news has already been planted now in the very first book of the Bible. There is hope. Man and woman are savable. It's not all doom and gloom. The good news is there. If you know, if you know that your current standing before God is not good, it's not good. And you can identify with the biblical record of man's fallen condition. 
this is the news that you need to listen carefully. That God can save you. God can put you back together. He can heal you. He can help you. And he can make a home for you in eternal glory. But there's only one way. You can't self-determine it for yourself. You have to accept God's way. Man and woman were left to their own way in Genesis and it ended up in the mess that you're experiencing today. There is only one way out and it's through another man and that is the man, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Let's just stand for a moment. We've been sitting for a while. I know it's a bit hot and we're getting a little bit sleepy. But let's stay awake to this. Salvation is available now. A saviour is ready to take you and save you today and turn things around for you into the right direction. The question is, will you accept it? Will you say, yes, I want what God is offering me. I want his plan and purpose of salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ ask you to give your heart, surrender your heart, all that you are to him this morning. Let's just close our eyes and let's pray. Think about this very, very carefully. It will be the most important decision that you make in your life. And one day you will be asked, what did you do with my son Jesus? What did you do with him? Did you reject him or did you receive him? I sent him into the world for you to come and get you. Did you hold his hand? Did you take hold of his hand? I pray that today will be that day. Lord, as we contemplate what you have told us, what's happened in the past, and we see around us what's happening in our present time, even perhaps what's happened in our own life. Lord, we know and we realize more and more that we need to be saved. We need a rescuer. And we thank you for the righteous man, the Lord Jesus Christ, whom you sent into the world to die on the cross. And your word says, to as many as have received him, to them he gave the power to be the sons and daughters of God. Lord, I pray if there's anyone here this morning that has not yet received with an open heart the Lord Jesus Christ into their life. I pray, Lord, that they would pray and ask right now just a moment of quietness in their own quiet heart to put aside all the turmoil and all the disasters and the calamity and the mess. We thank you for the mess. We have a message. And that message is Jesus Christ. Just take that moment now. I ask you to pray and ask Jesus Christ into your life to be your personal Lord and Savior. Ask him to forgive you or through him to have your sins all forgiven and that you be willing to turn from sin, turn from the great I and turn to the great God. Father of us all, through the Lord Jesus Christ. If you've done that this morning, I would really appreciate it that you would just come and tell me. Make it a, a, a testament from your mouth, from your heart to your mouth, and say, yes, Pastor, I've, I've done that this morning. I've accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Lord, give us that strength and courage, Lord, that we need. Give us this great understanding as we minister to the public brokenness in the world around us. Lord, help us in our understanding of what was really taking place when sin took a foothold in this world. Lord, help us to be stronger in our appetites against sin, that we would have a greater, stronger appetite for the righteousness and the goodness of God. Lord, if there's anything that we need to repent from this morning, Lord, we do that now also. We thank you, Lord, that you've taken us 
from the problems of Adam and you've put us into the paradise of Christ and you've made all things ready. Lord, we bless you and we thank you that even in Genesis, you had not only planted seeds in the Garden of Eden, but you had also planted the seed of the gospel of Christ. We thank you, we praise you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.